Okay, um, we're studying Macbeth and I realize that Shakespeare is difficult for many of you, so I want to share with you a technique for learning to love the bard. The bard, of course, is the poet. That's how we refer to Shakespeare, who many believe is the greatest poet of the English language. Uh, learning to love the bard and loving Shakespeare's plays and she, seeing Shakespeare's plays performed has added a lot to my life so I want to share that with you. I know it's not easy and I'm going to recommend a technique. It takes effort. The thing to remember about Shakespeare is that he is a poet and I would think of his plays as dramatic poems and probably it's best not to just pick them up and read them from the first page to the last as you would read a novel but borrowing an idea from Emma Smith the great Shakespearean scholar I would say read the important bits first actually not quite read because remember these are plays they're dramatic poems but they're also plays and they're meant to be performed, acted out loud. So I think that the first step is to actually listen. So I would recommend that you take an important passage. Now we all know there's Macbeth, there's Lady Macbeth, and they have some of these important soliloquies. We will have heard some of that language before. So you have a rough idea of what the important passages are. Of course you could always Google most important soliloquies in Macbeth and try to find an important passage. So what I've done is I've chosen an important soliloquy, Act 1, Scene 5, Enter Lady Macbeth. When Lady Macbeth enters the play. She enters reading a letter from her husband. Her husband is all excited because he's met these three witches and they've told him that he will become Thane of Cawdor and then that he will become king and he has already become Thane of Cawdor so he has to write to his wife, his dearest partner in greatness and explain to her how he's this close to becoming king and the implication is he just needs to kill Duncan and then he will become king because he is the hero from the battlefield. So the first thing I would do is once you've chosen the soliloquy is listen to it. You can listen to it from lit to go at the University of San Francisco. Just Google USF Macbeth and you'll find it and then you can read it at the same time. So listen and read the soliloquy first before you even really try to understand it. Just hear it. Hear it and see it. Look at some of the words. Maybe you'll look up some of the words. I, of course, will always have a print version with me. You know, this is the um, Arden Third Edition. I've also got the New Cambridge Edition. Uh, I, I like to have notes. It's important to have notes. I also like this, uh, you know, this Shakespeare Navigator that looks like it's um, Act 1, Scene 5. So lots of notes here from, from this guy, Philip Weller. Uh, he's really done a good job. But I'm going to go ahead and read it now. First, I'm going, like I said, first I'm going to listen to it. Let's just hear a, a few seconds of it so I can hear what it sounds like. So great, you know, let's just hear it from a professional actress, that's Kate Fleetwood, she does a great job, and uh, hear the, hear the uh, soliloquy first. But now, I want to actually, now that I've heard it, I've read it, I've looked up a few words, I have some notes, I have a rough idea of the context, I, I have some idea of what's going on, now I want to understand it. So let's break it down and try to unpack this soliloquy. All right, so um, let's get into it. Gloms thou art, and Cawdor, and shalt be what thou art promised. So listen, three steps there. You were Gloms, I knew that. Now you've become Cawdor, and the next step is you shall be what thou art promised. In other words, you will become the king. Yet do I fear thy nature. 
It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. So she's fearing his nature, that he's too soft, too full of the milk of human kindness, too natural. Now, human kindness there has a double meaning because it's both kindness in terms of being kind, but it's also being of humankind and not being willing to connect to the spirits and supernatural forces. And so he's too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. The nearest way, of course, is just to kill Duncan. Kill Duncan, and then you will become the king, right? That's the nearest way. It's only a step away, but you are too full of the milk of human kindness, my husband, to do it. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness that should attend it. You want to be great, you want to be king, you have ambition. The double negative there suggests that Macbeth himself is of two minds, but without the illness should attend it. The illness is the killer instinct, the ability to do evil that you need to become great and to realize your ambition. What thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou holily. It's a bit of a difficult line there, but look at the repetition and the alliteration, and clearly Shakespeare is both comparing and contrasting the words highly and holily. So you want to get to high places, but you want to do it in a holy way. But that's not how you get to high places. You need that killer instinct. Wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst wrongly win. You don't want to play false, you don't want to cheat, you don't want to get there the quick way, the nearest way. Instead, you want to be good, but you don't mind winning wrongly if the witches come along and help you. You're happy to win in a wrong way, you just don't want to do the wrongfulness yourself. Thou'st have great gloms, that which cries, thus thou must do, if thou have it, and that which rather thou dost fear to do, than wishest should be undone. Now that's a difficult passage, but it's clear now that she's talking about him hesitating and being afraid and not having the guts to actually kill the king. What that refers to is the crown. Okay, because thou wouldst have great gloms, that which cries, thou, thus thou must do. What is crying, thus thou must do? It's the crown. The crown is saying, if you want <laughs> to have me, you better kill Duncan. But you're afraid to do it because you're afraid that after you do it, you're going to wish it's undone. Now, uh, Kate Fleetwood sings these next three words. Hi, the hither. Hurry up, boy, come here, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round. So what impedes her husband from the golden round? It's his weakness, it's the, the milk of human kindness, it's his hesitation. It's the fact that he doesn't want to play false, that he wants to be holy. All these things are impeding him from the golden round, from grabbing that crown, which is right there for the taking, but he's not willing to do it. But come here, boy, my tongue. Interesting that it's her tongue is going to tell you what to do and chastise your weaknesses away. And that's going to going to allow you to achieve the golden round which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have crowned the crowned with all. In other words, the witches, the supernatural forces, and fate seem to have the crowned already, to have crowned you with that crown. It seems like you already have that crown. It's so close the witches have already said you're going to have it. You just need to take it, but you don't have the guts to take it. So come here, boy, and I'm going to lecture you and tell you what you need to do. And of course, then comes the messenger with further metaphysical aid. Unbelievable. Duncan happens to be coming to our castle 
under my battlements tonight.